Okay, so welcome uh, to this session. Uh, my name is Jakob Ian. I work for a company called Active Solution here in Stockholm. Uh, we're building custom solutions for our customers, mainly on the Azure platform. We have a very nice booth outside with AI Clippy and uh, lots of cool stuff. And so please join us. Take a picture. All right. Sorry you had to see that. Uh, I am an uh, Azure MVP. You have my contact info on this slide, so please uh, come to the booth, talk to me afterwards, tweet me, or send angry comments on my blog. Uh, I love to have discussions around this topic and, uh, well, most topics around software development and food, actually. It's interesting. So, this is the title of the presentation, Real Programmers Commit to Master. So, I thought that was a funny... I actually found this, this mem somewhere. And I thought it was a really fun title, so it's kind of tongue-in-cheek. So the session is really about uh, what is sometimes called as trunk-based development. So how can you work as a software team without doing a lot of branching, a lot of long-lived branching, feature branching, release branching, instead of trying to work everybody on the same branch and trying to deploy stuff into production without you know, crashing it all the time. So that's kind of the topic for this presentation. So, I worked with a customer for a couple of years ago, uh, and they're building this uh, very complex uh, product, uh, big teams, uh, distributed and so on, and uh, their domain model was very complex, and they realized that uh, we have to do that, this big refactoring work to get past this, because we're being blocked by this old decision that's not valid anymore. So they decided to, okay, this is going to be clearly it's going to break a lot of things, so we have to create a branch for this. So it wasn't called the big refactoring branch, but it was called something else. Uh, and the idea was that this is going to take around two months to complete, so it should be fine. Let's do some merges along the way, uh, and we, you know, we'll be good. So you know, that didn't really happen. Uh, so they started working, they did a lot of changes. Pretty soon they realized that there's, we can't merge from, from master anymore because we made too much changes. So let's just go on and hope this will, this will work in the end. So they kept working for, I think it was around six or seven months. And this was a team of six, seven people working for seven months uh, in a completely different branch. And uh, when it was time to you know, say, okay, now it's time to merge back. Now we really need to release this stuff. It was like this, you know? Everybody knew that this is really, really scary. And so, of course, uh, it ended in this Big Bang merge, which is a you know, concept. And it actually ended with this stuff not being merged at all. It was not possible to, to go back because it has changed into two completely different products. So I had to kind of pick this one or, or the new one, and they stuck with the old one. So all that work was completely wasted. Now. I think most people here know that this is a bad idea to do this long-lived branches and work for that long time before actually doing anything. But what about feature branching? How many here are doing feature branching? This is very, very common. So the idea is that when you start working on a new feature, uh, you create a feature branch for that. So maybe you have a team on that feature or a few people working on that feature. Uh, and they can work now in, in isolation, you know, so they can commit happily in there uh, while you know, other development keep going on master, or you have another feature branch, because the idea is that you're supposed to be able to work, you know, in parallel. So you have two or three teams working on different features at the same time, and they can work in isolation, which is nice. It's very comfortable for those developers working in that branch, because they don't really have to care about what's going on in the other branches. Um, so the problem is now that uh, in the end, the feature X team now merges back to master because they're done. Um, and also, a lot of companies I talk to that do feature branching, they do this because they want to be able to kind of select which features are going out in the next sprint or the next deployment. So it seems like this is a good idea then, because then you can pick like feature X branch and feature Z branch, and then we'll just merge it, and then we'll deploy it. And that doesn't really work a lot of the time, because this integration is being done very, very late in the process. So typically around this time, when feature Y is going back, then it's you have to merge it very late. You haven't really tested this combination of those two feature branches together. That's done very late in the process. Also, it's kind of hard because the feature Y team here, they can't really reverse, uh, do like reverse integration merges from master because they, then they will end up with code from the feature X branch. Oops. 
So then they would have a, you know, the branch containing both X and Y at the same time. So that's not a good thing. So they kind of need to work in isolation and postpone this, this, uh, this integration with master. So that's also a problem. Another thing that this causes is, what about refactoring? What about this continuous improvement of work along the way? If you work in an, in, in an isolated branch, I, I think most of you would kind of sense this, and I do it myself, and I'm not sure what are the other teams that are up to right now. Do I want to make a, like a nice refactoring, changing a lot of stuff in the code base, if I'm not sure what they are doing over here? Typically not, that doesn't happen. You kind of get scared about it, so you postpone that. I think I will do that next sprint, but that generally you know, never really happens. So kind of, because you're not doing really continuous integration here, so most companies now, they have you know, CI servers. So they're running CI builds here, they're running CI builds up there and here, but it doesn't really help because they're not integrating. You know, it's not continuous integration. So it's, it's is continuous isolation. So trunk-based development, so what's that? So trunk is like this old term for what we now call a master or mainline or whatever, like the, the, the branch that your, your golden software is running on that from which you deploy from. So the idea is that everybody instead works uh, on the master branch, and you deploy from the master branch, or you make a really like short-lived release branch and deploy from that one. So it could also look like this: that when it's time to release, you just create a, create a branch just to say because you want to say that this is the feature set that is going out in the next release, and then the rest of the teams just keep working on the master branch. So what can this look like if you're a team that's following this practice? Uh, so you have this master branch, you, you, you know, keep committing work into master. And to be clear here, when I say I commit to master, it doesn't mean that I can't create a branch. A lot of teams create branches for pull requests. But the, you know, the idea is that th these branches are short-lived. That's a way of getting code into master. And I will talk more about pull requests later. So it's not that you, you're not allowed to create branches. You create branches all the time in Git. But it's not a permanent branch, it's not a long-lived branch. Usually lasts for less than a day, just to get just a way to get code into master. Okay, so then we we create a release branch. It's time to you know prepare for release 1.0. Uh, the rest of the team just keeps on going in the master branch. Uh, and then maybe we found in, like in the last uh, testing round, we found some some error uh, with this release going out. So what do we do now? Now okay, we need to fix this bug, of course. And uh, what's a bit different now with trunk-based development? I think most Perhaps most people here would fix the bug in the release branch now, right? Because that's, you know, that's what it's for. That's where you stabilize the release. Now, if you're following trunk-based development, you don't do that. You fix the bug in, in master. You only are allowed to commit to master. That, that's like the general principle. And then you cherry pick that commit into release. So why is that a good thing? Anybody want to guess? So the main problem with fixing bugs in a separate branch is the risk for regressions. And anybody who has, has regression bugs, they never want to do that again because it's really embarrassing. If you fix a bug, you know, you fix a bug in release 1.0 branch, you deploy it into production, so it's fixed. But next, next release, it wasn't merged back into master, so you have a regression. And you're really bad in front of your customers and in front of users. So that is a really bad thing. If you're fixing bugs on master, then this will never be an issue because you know that this bug will definitely be in the next release as well. So this is the, the, the main idea, that you always work in trunk and you cherry pick it. And as long as the time isn't too far here, then this is usually not a problem. So same thing, maybe we found this keep working and we find the production bug. Same thing, we create a branch and you, most people know, but some people don't know that you can create a branch you know, back in time. You don't have to, you know, uh, you, can, you can create a branch from a previous commit. So in this case, you would create a branch from the commit that is currently in production. Again, you fix the bug in trunk, you cherry pick it into, uh, into your hotfix branch and you deploy it into production and you keep going. So this is a general idea about around the trunk-based uh, development. And you know, just to mix the slides up, uh, I want to do sh some short demos in between. And uh, how many here are using uh, Azure DevOps? A few of you, so for the for the source control and CI and so on. And actually, Microsoft themselves are following this. The, the team that develops Azure DevOps, they are doing trunk-based development uh, 
in their way. So that they are the same principle. You commit to master and you cherry pick that change into their release branch. So they actually built in kind of nice support for this, uh, this uh, procedure. So here is a pull request that I prepared that fixes something important. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and you know approve it because everything looks great. So now this is a pull request of what I fixed something, uh, and it, this is supposed to go into master. So I'll complete it. So okay, so now I have this change is going into master. So some build will kick off, uh, but you can also see now that it's. Uh, you get two options here. You get this uh, revert, which is kind of undo, but then you also get this cherry pick. And this is for exactly this reason, because they do the same thing here. Now they want to cherry pick this commit into their release branch or hotfix branch. So in this case, I would select the target branch. And here I have prepared a hotfix for you know the February da da da. So again, and it will, it will kind of, so this will in fact create a new pull request going into the hotfix branch. So I just click cherry pick, and now you know it creates a new pull request for me, taking that change uh, to my release branch. Uh, so you want to make this procedure as easy as possible, so it doesn't you know become too much of a hurdle for the developers. So they they kind of built in support for this uh, workflow, and of course you, this is uh, this is Git, so you can do you know cherry picking in a lot of ways. But it's kind of nice to do it in this way because now you also automatically get a pull request because pull requests will then be associated with running builds and other kinds of verification along the way. So you don't make this in this quick fixes. So that's nice. So, okay, so, so what are the benefits around this uh, trunk based development? Uh, well, first of all, Clearly, you, you minimize the, the, the merge conflicts, the work around merging, because everybody's committing into master. And along this line, it also encourages making really small batches of work. Because if you are a team of 10 developers working continuously and you sit and work locally for a long time with your commit, the changes start to pile up locally. You know that this, this will probably be a problem for me if I don't commit uh, frequently. So it kind of encourages you to work in, in small batches, in small changes. And that's a really good thing to do. It also encourages refactoring, as, as I mentioned before. And uh, in general, teams experience that they, they get better delivery throughput. Uh, so the team gets more and more focused on delivering stuff uh, consecutively into, into production. Um, so, okay, so how can we do this? So I talked about like how, how it works with the branching and so on, but clearly there are more things to, to look out for here, because if we just committing code into master, won't that break a lot of stuff? That's, that's a general fear. And of course, that's a big risk for it. So you need to think about it. So first of all, you, you need to work in, in, as I mentioned, small incremental uh, batches of work. And these changes in general need to be compatible, so, you know, because you need to be able to deploy this stuff along, all, all along the way. Because everything going into master should be ready for release. Uh, but when, when you're working on, on new features, uh, it will, you know, take more than a day typically to, to, to uh, finish a feature. Uh, but these com commits will go into production anyway, so you need to find ways to, you know, to hide this work until it's finished. And to do that, you usually use uh, feature toggles in a way to hide this feature from the, from the end users until it's done. So we're going to talk about that. Also, you need to think about ways of enforcing quality uh, in your changes. Uh, and you, wouldn't, you want to do that as soon as possible as much as possible of this quality work needs to be done before the change actually ends up in master. Of course, you will still have this pipeline after master, and it will go through different stages, and you run tests against it. Uh, but the shorter this, uh, this uh, feedback loop is, uh, the better. So you want to do things like, of course, running verification builds, running unit tests, doing code review, etc., etc. all these things to make sure that the code going into master is of as high quality as possible. Uh, and at the end, Eventually, you know, sooner or later, you will deploy bad code into production. Everybody does that uh, for, for any, any kind of reason. Uh, and when you deploy stuff often into to production, uh, you want to make sure that if you're deploying bad code, if you get a problem, you want to try to make this, that problem impact as few users as possible. So instead of deploying a new feature to everyone uh, across all your environments, try to minimize this, do this incrementally. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some, some deployment techniques that you can use for, for trying to make safe deployments. Uh, 
Okay, so, so feature toggles. So, so the concept is really, really easy. Uh, you have this uh, maybe web page, you have a boring grid there, and you want to you change that into a fancy graph. But that will take a while. I can't com you know, make that in two hours and, and commit it. I need to work for a couple of days, uh, or perhaps longer. So you create a feature toggle. And feature toggle is just you know, an if-else statement, uh, and to keep it simple. And you, you deploy this with this feature toggle turned off. So the, so the new graph is there, but it's not visible for the end users. And after you know, one week, perhaps, uh, it's ready. And it's time to you know, turn the switch on. And now the users will see this, this new graph instead of that boring table. So th this is a principle. And as I said, this is you know, a glorified if-else statement. So the, the toggle itself is nothing, nothing fancy, so to say. And uh, Martin Fowler, of course, uh, has a long article around feature toggles, where he also classifies these uh, toggles. And, and along the line of uh, one line, you have this uh, dynamism of you know, how often does a feature toggle change. So like in one end of the spectrum, you change the toggle when you release something uh, to where you actually change it with every request, for example, determining uh, what kind of role the current user have. On the other, uh, on the y-axis, you have the, the the period of time that this feature toggle should be should be should exist. And in many ways, you want to keep this toggle short-lived and remove them when it's done. But some of these toggles, for example, around permissions, this is you know role-based security. Really, if I am an administrator, I should see this screen. If I'm not an administrator, I should not see it. That's that's really a feature toggle if you want to call it that. So they will li live for a long time. If you have feature toggles, you can, in some cases, actually let users themselves turn them on and off. So this is also from Azure DevOps, where they are exposing. They have, of course, a lot of feature toggles internally, but some of them are exposed to the end users. So I can select uh, these uh, features myself or for my team. So and, and this is really a win-win situation, because I can get to use new features that might so solve problems for me. And Microsoft, in this case, will get the valuable telemetry back from, from users using these preview features. And you know, if they would cause me any problem, then I can just switch it off. So this is a really nice idea to use that. So when you're implementing feature toggles, the question is, OK, where, where should I put them? So let's pretend you have this UI, and the UI calls an API, and you know, they have some logic, and you have some storage along the way. So, Let's say I'm working on uh, adding some new, maybe that new graph that we just talked about. Where, where do I need to add, or where should I add my feature toggle code? Well, obviously, I, I have to add it in my UI, because that's where I'm changing stuff. So is that enough? Well, so do, I, do I need to actually put it somewhere else? Well, in this case, maybe the UI calls you know, a new endpoint on my API. OK, but if the UI isn't visible, it will never call that endpoint, right? So I, I don't need to put a feature toggle there. Or do I? Because the thing is, that endpoint will actually exist there. It will be exposed. So you need to think about these things, that if you're adding new endpoints, even though you're not calling them, someone else might call in them. And you need to think about security as well. So don't put out new endpoints without any security just because you're not calling them. So in general, you want to put your feature toggles as high up as possible, as early as possible. But don't forget these these public, publicly exposable layers. Uh, so, but you, you probably don't want to put it down here because there's no point in like duplicating this this if else checks all all the way down here. That doesn't give you any benefit. It just gives you technical debt, really. So okay, so let's in the case where I just talked about, if you have a, a web page and you just want to add something to it, it that, that's the easy case. You just wrap that stuff into an, into an, with, a, with a feature toggle. Uh, but sometimes you, you, know, you make more changes. Maybe you're uh, removing stuff, you're moving stuff around in your web page, uh, you're adding stuff, you're, you remove something else. So now it becomes kind of a cumbersome. If, if it's that many changes, do I need to put like 15 if statements uh, in, my, in my web page? Probably not. That's probably not a good idea. So somewhere along this line, it's usually better to just keep this old page and you know keep working on start working on this new page in parallel with the, with the existing one. And they would use routing to you know. So if this is the order page, this this existing order route will just keep working. So all users will be directed to the existing page, and then you as a team can can start working on this other page. And of course, there will be some duplicated code here, because you're basically copying the old one and start working on it. But that's fine, because this is for a, a short period of time. And when you're done, you can, you, know, you can remove the old screen. 
But now you can also add you know, feature toggles to the mix, because when you're almost done, you're perhaps ready for a preview. So then you can actually enable this new screen for, for uh, you know, some pilot customer, for example, to get feedback. So feature toggles gives you this kind of nice way of exposing functionality to certain users and, and allow you to get feedback for it. So about implementing feature toggles, there are, I would say most companies that do this, they, they wrote their own ones, they, they build this themselves, and it's not that complicated. And there are several different frameworks. This is for around, around .NET, so the end feature, feature toggles one. Uh, but this is now so common, so there's, there's also multiple different solutions out there that actually implement feature toggles as a service. So launch darkly, roll out IO, split IO, and there are some more of them. They have SaaS services uh, for implementing feature toggles for you. So instead of you calling your own code to ask if this feature available for this user, you'll call this service instead. Uh, and the nice thing is that they then also add, they, they have extra uh, additional functionality around feature toggles. So it's not just answering yes or no on my question, because you can build functionality around uh, feature toggles. So I just want to do a quick demo of Launch Darkly, which is one of these services. So in this case, I have some uh, old you know, demo application for, called Parts Unlimited from Microsoft. And uh, I'm working on a new feature, which is the member portal. So I want, and this is now hidden. It's going to show up uh, to, the, to the top right. Uh, but it's now hidden behind the feature flag. And I can just quickly show you the code, what it looks like. So in this case, it's very easy. I use my SDK for C Sharp. I send in the current user as the, as the key. Uh, and then I'm asking, is this uh, feature called member portal? Is that, uh, should that be turned on for this user or not? So it's very, very simple. So when launch darkly, then I get this, uh, I have an account there. So I get this dashboard where I can create multiple uh, products and each product can have a set of feature flags. So in here, I created this uh, feature flag called member portal. Uh, it's currently turned uh, off. So let's turn it on. I have to confirm it that I really want to turn it on. So and if I refresh this page, uh, I now get this, uh, you know, this member portal. So, so this is a very easy example of, you know, and it, so, okay, so now this might seem like an overkill. Why do I need to call this external service just to, to ask about this feature? Is it turned on or not? So you get typically from these services, you get a lot of extra uh, services around this. So, you know, you, you get, you, first of all, you get this nice dashboard just turning things on and off again for, for users. Uh, and you get the statistics to see is this feature flag used? How often is it used? And so on. Uh, you can also connect things like goals, so kind of like A-B testing. So you, you, you see that if I create this feature flag, if I show a, a, a new UI for a user, uh, will that user more, is, is it more likely to you know, buy my products, for example? So you can create goals around this and, and target specific user groups and see is it, is my, are my feature ma making sense for my users and so on. So, and, and the other solutions have, have similar, similar functionality around this. Has anybody used any of these services? Yeah, yeah. Launch darkly. Okay, yeah. So some, con some considerations and for around feature toggles. So in general, you want to have as few as possible, uh, and you know, remove them as uh, when you're done. And they should be as high up as possible in in your code path, uh, so you're not duplicating these checks all along the way because it's it can become a real mess having all these if else statements. So remove and done, and, and some of these services also have this functionality around is this feature flag being used, or is it always returning the same, the same value for a certain period of time? Then that is a signal that you should probably uh, remove this feature flag from your code. Because as I said, you don't want to have like, a lot of if-else statements lying around in your code base. Of course, you need to use telemetry uh, along this way if you want to make sense of these feature flags. How, how is my code being used by my users when I turn this feature flag on and off again? That is what it will allow you to do, you know, A-B testing and, and all those sort of things. A common question is, okay, but do I need to test all these combinations? So if I have, you know, four feature flags and they can be on and off, that's, you know, 16 different combinations. So do I need to test this software 16 times? 
And of course, in an ideal world, you would do that, but that's, it's not very realistic, certainly not for, for manual testing and not even for automated testing. Uh, so in general, I, th I see companies compromising and say, let's test it with all, all flags turned on and let's test it with all flags turned off. Uh, and then you, in some cases, you might have combinations, but in general, at least those two cases should be handled. Uh, and that can be handled pretty efficiently by your deployment pipeline. First, you deploy it and switch on the flags and run tests, and then you switch off the flags and run the same test again and, and verify that everything works. And again, don't ship security holes. Think about these uh, endpoints that you're exposing. So shift left is, is this uh, kind of trend around pushing quality as soon as possible in, in your pipeline. This is not really related to shift left, but I thought it was funny. I guess it's a tennis game or something. And you really wonder, what is he looking at? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you have this, uh, this uh, deployment pipeline, your process of work where change is coming in, and you have your CI pipeline and they're deploying stuff into production. And this is a, it could be a lengthy process. And so this is about uh, ensuring that you, you're checking your quality as soon as possible, as fast as possible along the way, instead of waiting and running all the tests in the end. Let's do it as soon as possible. So if you are using pull requests, then this is a great place of, uh, for, for doing a lot of this work. So code review is an obvious thing to do if you're doing pull requests. This will allow your team members to, to have a look at your code uh, for, you know, for design guidelines, for you know, four I, the 4i principle. Uh, but you will also connect uh, typically a, a, an automated build for your, for your pull requests. And that allows you to do things like uh, doing code analysis, uh, security checking, and of course running a lot of unit tests and, and perhaps some fast integration tests. So this is now run before anything actually hits the master. And that's really important to, to think about. Once the code is in master, we will of course continue to run tests against it. Then we typically deploy this into some test environment and you run some functional tests against it. And those tests are typically slower, so, so that's why we want to run them a bit later. So as I mentioned, pull requests is a great uh, place to do this. And uh, most, uh, most uh, solutions out there have, have this concept of, of, of guarding your branches. So in Azure DevOps, you can set up a set of policies for your master branch to make sure that uh, things are checked before going in there. So in this case, I'm, I'm demanding that every code change needs to be reviewed. I have to link the change to work item describing why I do this change, and I need to run a, a build that needs to be successful before I'm allowed to merge it into master. And you can add additional things like calling external uh, systems and so on. So th this is a great place to, to, to run these checks in. But of course, testing is, is really, really important here. That, that is really what's going to uh, save you from a lot of deploying you know, bad code into production. So and this is the, the famous test pyramid that tries to describe what typical ty types of automated uh, tests, plus you have manual tests at the bottom. So this is what it should look like. You have a lot of unit tests at the bottom, then you have some integration tests, the test may be on the API level, and at the top you have some UI tests that actually test the entire system, and you do some exploratory manual testing. Now the reality is very often you turn this around, this is called the, the ice cream cone ant pattern because it looks like an ice cream cone. And this is very common, uh, that, uh, that it looks like this. So, so one of my current clients are, are uh, in this situation. They started investing heavily in, in automated tests a couple of years ago. And the thing is, when you start working on a kind of a legacy code base and you want to add tests to the mix, it's really hard to just start writing unit tests but, because very often the code isn't really designed to be testable. And even if you start creating unit tests, you get very, very little code coverage in the beginning. So it's kind of a mental thing. It feels kind of, this doesn't m give me anything. It takes time to get code coverage from unit tests. So it's very tempting now to, to do some tests on, on higher up in the chain, like integration tests or even UI tests, because they're not that hard to write. They're sometimes even easier to write than the unit tests. And they give a lot of code coverage. You can click around you know, using Selenium, for example. You can click around and, and, and hit a lot of code here. So it's, it feels very nice in the beginning. Uh, but the problem is that you know you keep working, you get more and more of these tests. And the problem with these tests are they are, first of all, very, very slow. They're like a thousand times slower in general than the unit test. Uh, but even more problematic is that they are, when they fail, they, they tend to be very flaky. So, you know, so this customer that, um, that I mentioned, they, they typically have a certain amount of flaky tests every night. 
uh, and then they just rerun the tests. It's very common because they know that eventually it will pass. So, so they rerun it uh, multiple times. And this is not uncommon. And some tools, I, I think Azure DevOps has this option of rerunning failed tests. So, so they are not alone for sure. Um, and also if the test fails for a valid reason, it's very hard to track that error down because it can be caused by so many things. If you're, if you're hitting the entire system, what part, why did it fail? So it takes a lot of time to, to track down failed tests uh, every morning. So I want to talk a little bit about some uh, kind of a public case around this that, that Microsoft has published. So they have been doing this huge transformation the last couple of years from being this dinosaur delivering software every two years into this cloud native company deploying all the time. Uh, and they, they publish a lot of very interesting articles around this. So I really recommend you. I, I include the link here. So, so go ahead and, and read these articles because it's really interesting how you can do these things at scale. So they were pretty much in the same situation as, as this customer talked about. So they had what they called nightly tests. It took 20, 22 hours. After those nightly tests, they ran a full automation uh, run test, which took up to two days. And again, these tests failed frequently, which resulted in developers didn't really pay attention. They just left it. And so at the end of the sprint, uh, that's when everybody, when they, when they were kind of feature complete, then they said, OK, let's start fixing these tests. And that could easily take another sprint, just fixing these tests, because they just postponed it, and the tests were so hard to, to track down. So this was really slowing them down and causing a lot of frustration. So they did kind of this retake, uh, along with a lo lots of other things. So back to this is four years ago. They, they stated some principles that should be true for, for working with tests and, and test automation. So things like tests should be written at the lowest level possible. You know. Prefer unit tests over anything else. Uh, and the product must be designed for testability. Uh, things like test ownership follows product ownership. So the team working on a specific part of the product, they should also be in charge of the tests. So this is a, you know cross-functional teams. So you have both developers and, and test engineers and, and QA on the same team uh, because it, it just makes so much sense. And what they also did was that they created this test taxonomy. And, and uh, so this is one way of doing it, and it's, uh, I think it's a pretty nice idea that you categorize these different types of tests. So instead of, before they talked about how long this test took to run, so they had nightly tests and full automation run tests. Now instead they, they said that let's look at the, the dependencies of these tests. So you have like the unit tests and functional tests, so they have four different categories, where the L0 one is the, the pure unit tests. They have no external dependencies, they can run in memory, and they can run really, really fast. And they also set like these uh, thresholds. This should not take more than 60 milliseconds to run any given unit test. And if it's slower, the, the build will fail. So they, they enforce that. So, so the next step is the L1 test. So that's a unit test, but it has some external dependencies. It might hit the database. So this is for you know, the Azure DevOps system. It's, it's pretty heavy on, on SQL Server. So that's why in this case, they allowed you to write tests targeting the SQL Server. And that, of course, will be slower. So Average is around 400 milliseconds, and it can't be over two seconds. Then that test will fail, and so on. And then you have the, the functional tests, and these are, are then executed, you know, on uh, on deployed systems. Um, so the L2 ones are, are deployed, are run against test uh, system, and the L3 ones they are actually running against production. So this is test the full deployment, and they're doing this in production. So this is really you know testing in production that used to be a joke is now a reality because it's it's almost impossible to have a, a staging environment that is identical to your production environment. It's a lot of work to just restoring data and, and keeping up to date with all the changes. But even if you do, you still don't have the same amount of users testing your stuff. So it just makes more sense to run some of these tests in production instead. And uh, they worked around two years going from this uh, old slow tests, the orange one, uh, you know, gradually replacing them with this new, faster type of tests. So over here, two, around two years later, they have this uh, L0 tests, uh, which is then uh, maybe 90% of the tests are unit tests, and then they have a few uh, functional uh, tests that are executed as well. So I this is the, the uh, 
a slide I saw from uh, Microsoft. Um, so this is the, the current PR build. So this build is run on every pull request. And at this point in time, they're now running 84,000 uh, unit tests on every PR build. And it says 18 minutes here. I think it's, I, I saw lower numbers, but uh, so maybe it's, it's a bit up now. It used to run around 10 minutes. And this is important to keep this, uh, this loop fast. It shouldn't really be more than 10 minutes. So I think they need some more build servers, perhaps, to, to speed these things up. OK, so uh, what about deployment? As I said before, even if we have all these quality checks, uh, we will still deploy stuff into production that uh, you know, will cause problems. So as I mentioned before, we need to think about Th ways of deploying new versions that doesn't hit all the all my users at the same time. So instead, try to roll out new versions incrementally. Um, so this is things like canary releases and, or dark launches, uh, two ways of describing basically the same thing, that you're not deploying everything at the same time. You, it said you're deploying it in, in stages. Um, also, this concept of, of separating a deployment from a release, and this is what really what a feature toggle gives you. So deployment, that's, uh, that's actually deploying new bits to your servers, but release, that's actually turning on a feature for a user, and that's two different things. You don't have to deploy it and make it visible at the same time, because that, that's a big risk in general, because the deployment can go wrong itself, or the feature itself could be incorrect, uh, and so on. So if you first deploy it, then you, you let the system run for a while, make sure everything is good, then you turn the feature on. That gives you an extra uh, safety guard. And also try to implement automated release gates along, this, uh, along the way here. Try to remove manual tasks and make sure that everything looks good. Uh, and I will show you some examples of that. So a canary release. Um, this is, you divide your, your, your user base into different groups, where you call the, the first group canaries. And this comes from this old the concept of, of the coal miners going into a mine. And to make sure that there wasn't any toxic gas there, they sent in this canary bird first. And if that canary bird kept singing, they knew that, OK, it's fine. That we, can, we can go down there. It's safe. And you can think about your software in the same way as toxic gas, really. You know, <laughs> is this new version toxic or not? Let's, hit it, let's throw it to these uh, canary, canary users, these fools. Um, so, so this is very common. And, uh, so this is an example from, from Windows, how they roll out the Windows. So is anybody in the, in the fast ring of the Windows? So some of you, so you, 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 get, you get new versions faster than everyone else, you think. But, but you know, b before you get it, a lot of rings had all been taken place inside Microsoft. So they have their, their set of Canary users, and then the operating system group gets it, and then Microsoft gets it, and then you get it in the, in the fast ring. It's not as fast as you thought. Uh, this is from Azure DevOps, so this is kind of, uh, you know, they're deploying Azure DevOps using Azure DevOps, of course. Uh, and they also have this concept of, of deployment rings, uh, where the first ring is Microsoft themselves, and some, uh, some in, you know, for example, MVP accounts. I have an account in the first ring, so I get the new version as fast as possible. But this is their canary ring, so sometimes I get stuff that isn't really production ready, and they have to turn it off again. But I get to use cool stuff first. And then the next ring is one of the data centers. Uh, I don't remember which one. And then they kind of grow exponentially. So a full release in this case uh, typically takes uh, around a week. Because they deploy here to rings here on Monday and then let it cook there for like 24 hours, make sure everything looks fine. And then they move on to the next ring and then the next ring and so on. And if, it, if, it, if they notify problems, then they can stop there. And at least all user have, users haven't been uh, exposed to it. So if you combine this with, with feature toggles, uh, you, you really have a, a mechanism to, to protect your users from, from your bad code, really. So you, know, you have this, this CD pipeline where you, you build your artifacts, and then you deploy it to your canary, uh, canary users. Uh, so you deploy it, and everything looks good. Then you can swap this feature toggle and have your, uh, this could be multiple feature toggles. And now your users can test this new functionality. So typically, you add uh, you know, monitoring telemetry to, to the mix here to make sure that everything looks good. Uh, and then after a certain amount of time, everything looks good. You go into the next stage, and you approve it. And then you can deploy it to you know, early adopters. You flip the feature flags, and, and so on. 
And again, if something is problematic along the way, you can stop there. And and at, you know the, the last one, this should be like the big one. So here you have perhaps you know 90% of your user base. They would never see this this new feature because it hasn't been deployed at all to, into their into their environments. So this requires you to actually physically <laughs> separate uh, your your users into different environments, so you can deploy new versions uh, to to a targeted set of groupers of, of, of users. Dark launch is really kind of the same thing. You might hear this uh, term once in a while. It's really the same thing as a canary release, but it's typically used for deploying backend changes. Perhaps you're doing uh, performance work, um, and but you're kind of scared because the only real good way of, of validating uh, performance improvements is to run it in production. Um, so typically you, you deploy this change behind the feature flag into production. You flip the feature flag on for certain accounts, perhaps, and this is now being executed in production, but your end user doesn't really know it. That's why you call it a dark launch. And when everything is good, you, you, you just remove the feature flag and, and you're up and, and remove the old code base or the, the implementation. So release gates. So this is, this is a thing of along this uh, line of deploying stuff into production. You want to make sure that everything looks good, and that takes a lot of work. So you want to automate as much as possible here. So you want to have a process that just keeps on going without too much manual intervention. So some examples here could be, for example, incident management. So you deploy stuff, a new version, into some uh, test environment. Uh, and then you, perhaps you check your incident management system. Has any, uh, any you know, high priority bugs been posted the last two hours? If not, then you can automatically just go on into production. So then you have this fixed schedule of two hours after the last deployment to test. This will go into production unless we have a high priority bug, for example. We can also do check uh, user experience. So this is you know, using monitoring telemetry from your test system to see that has, for example, the num number of failed requests gone up. Uh, since we, we deployed the, the new version. If so, that could be a signal that we should not proceed, and then maybe we stop here. We can also call external systems to, to ask for verification. We can check the infrastructure health, for example, for our production environment. So before deploying into production, check the health of the, of the production system, uh, because if that's unhealthy at the moment, maybe it's not a good time to deploy a new version at the same time. And these are things that you can check uh, uh, in an automated way. You don't need to do this manually. And uh, I wanted to show you a demo of how you can do this in, in Azure DevOps. Uh, and, and other tools have, have similar solutions for this. So uh, this is a, a deployment pipeline I have for, for a sample application, where I have deployed it into a test environment. Then I ran a few uh, functional tests. And then I want to go into production. Uh, but now it's currently waiting here to go into production. And so the reason it's, it's waiting now is because I added some, some release gates to it. Um, well you can see back there. So in this case, I defined the two release gates for my production environment. So the first one checks, just the case I talked about, check a work item. So check my incident management system for high priority bugs. And in this case, there actually there is a bug because I created it before. Uh, so I, I have a bug that is uh, marked as high priority uh, just uh, in my incident management system, and that's why it's now waiting. It won't deploy it into production. At the same time, it's also use, uh, querying uh, Azure for, for monitoring alerts. Has there been any alerts re uh, recently in my production environment? In this case, it hasn't, so, so that gate is green. But I have two gates, and, and both of these gates need to be marked as green before it will actually continue. And I'm just going to show you what it looks like, how, how we implement this. So in my production environment, I have enabled gates. And I will try to zoom this up. So I have these two, two uh, gates. And uh, does this work? So and these are the, there are more you can actually install now. But th there are a set of uh, uh, gates that you can use here. 
And as you see, you can, you can call an Azure function or a REST API here. And that means that you can pretty much check anything here uh, in, in your systems or, or wherever and make sure that everything looks good before going on. Uh, actually, so there is a, a sample from Microsoft where they actually check Twitter. So they call it the, the Twitter sentiment analysis. It's actually valid for, for some customers. So the idea is that you deploy stuff into maybe a, a canary set of users in production, and then they monitor Twitter. And if people are writing about their system in a bad sentiment, in a bad mood, negative words, this release gate will actually stop. Because it seems like this could be a potential problem. If, if people just started writing bad stuff about our, our, our product, it could mean that we just deployed some, some bad code here. So it's an interesting way of, 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 of using this, uh, this kind of feature. All right, so uh, that's pretty much it, actually. Uh, so I talked about different ways here how you can make trunk-based development work. And I just want to end with this quote from, from Jess Humble. Uh, the author of uh, the Continuous Delivery book, which I think makes a lot of sense. So he says, put, this is trunk-based development is really about putting the needs of the team above the needs of the, of the individual. And th this is really true because all these things that I talk about, if you, if you, if you talk to a, a developer about this, uh, it's a very common reaction to think that this is just it's more work for me. I, I used to be able to work in my, my branch over here, and I was very efficient at it. And that could actually be true. He, maybe that developer was more productive in his branch alone, but the team wasn't. So it's really important to see the needs of the team, the needs of the company here, instead of focusing on, on, on my need. Um, so I, I think this quote makes, makes a lot of sense, actually. And this is, of course, valid of a lot of process things out there. So with that, I would say thank you. And uh, again, come to our booth outside here to uh, try AI Clippy. And also sign up if you're interested in doing bank ID integration. You can get some test vouchers there to do it for free. So thank you. <laughs>